This meeting is being recorded. <laughs> Hello, we've been just been told this meeting's being recorded. Um, welcome to another episode of Adoption, the Making of Me. We are here this morning. We, our guest, uh, we found through a, another guest, Carlina. And so we are excited to talk to Katie Betancourt. She is coming to us from Michigan. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Welcome, Katie. Really happy to have you. I, I know there's a lot. We talked to you briefly a few months ago, just for full disclosure. Um, but you had a trip coming up. So we're going to, I'm excited to hear all about that. But maybe just start, take, take us back <laughs> to like your story. You were adopted. You're an international adoptee, this yeah. we know. The making of Katie. Yeah. <laughs> um, so... Like your other guest, Carolina, I was adopted from Colombia in South America. I was adopted in March of 1978. And at that time, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. At that time, there was kind of, I don't want to say a popular theme, but I had a handful of kids in my high school who were all adopted from the same orphanage as me. So I think it was kind of the the thing to do at the time, and that's what my adoptive mom even said. Uh, so they, the Michigan, thing to do. 1978, <laughs> Michigan, key parties yeah. and adoptees from Columbia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think she found she used or they used a kind of intermediary group to find the orphanage and kind of do the home study and facilitate the adoption. And then they went down to Columbia and went to the orphanage and I was adopted from one called Fauna. Um, let's see, according to my documents, which I'm sure all Colombian adoptees know, but we don't, can't necessarily believe in what our documents say, especially from the adoptees from the 60s, 70s and early 80s, just because there's so much corruption in Colombian adoption meaning mothers were coerced, mothers were lied to, babies were taken without consent. Mm. Our names, birth dates, things were changed. A lot. Some of us have birth certificates full of information. Some of us have some information. Some of us have blank. And you never know if it was actually because there was just no information or because they decided not to put information. So according to my documents, I was born in a hospital my mother left after my birth. Uh, the, there's a name of a social worker on my documents that says they tried to look for her. I don't know what that means or how in depth that was, but they said that she put a false address and that the address didn't exist. And then I stayed in the hospital for three months and then was transferred to the orphanage, was in the orphanage for three months and then adopted like late like six months but towards closer towards seven months um, my mom said the orphanage was pretty small they now have like this big beautiful new building um, but at the time it was just out of a house she said it was a room full of cribs and they had just called her one day and said we have a baby available they went down they said there was a group of other parents kind of with them. Um, so they just showed up one day and they brought all the babies out and that was it. They gave them the documents that I now have. And so I guess I... Can I, can I interrupt for a second? So they brought the babies out in a like group of people, like, yeah, like everybody fine. just chose a baby? I think they pre-picked us for who <laughs> they were going to give us to. Because my mom said they did get a picture of me. Okay. Before they went. Um, but it was like a group of, I think she said three or four couples and they just brought the babies up to them. And I guess that was it. Um, <laughs> then I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My family was, I'd say, middle upper class, both associated with University of Michigan. I pretty, I had a pretty decent childhood outside of my adoptive family. Like I liked where I grew up. I had friends, things like that. But inside the family, I never really felt like I bonded. 
even at a very young age, like five years old, six years old, I remember thinking like, I'm just here, but these aren't like my people. These aren't at such a young age. I remember thinking that. And mm -hmm. were you the, um, were there any other children in the family before you came along? I, I guess I was the, what they say, like the replacement baby. Mm -hmm. My adopted mom lost a baby, I think a few hours after she was born and was told you can't have any more. So then they adopted me. And then four years after me, they ended up conceiving. She was very premature, but, um, so I do have a sister, but I'm older and me and her never, I never really felt like she wasn't my sister. I don't know if that was the older sim sibling, younger sibling thing. Cause I was the older sibling, <laughs> but me and her always were fine. You I were just, close. Yeah. I just never felt really bonded towards my adoptive parents. I think that they were kind of the worst mix of parents that an adoptee could get. My dad was very cold, distant, unemotional, kind of Asperger-y, and my mom was borderline personality disorder, very needy. Mm. So I got this extremes on both ends and kind of felt like I never really got what I needed. I was very much there to take care of my mom, be her friend, be her confidant. She even openly said to my sister and I, she had kids, so somebody would love her. Mm, I, <laughs> and even at a teenager, I was we're like, like oh. <laughs> I know, I, I was like, a, I think a, a tween or a teen when she said that. And I even looked at her and was like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so that was kind of my childhood. Um, the one thing I will say that I'll give to my adoptive mom is that she did make a big effort to kind of push me into learning about my culture. I was not into it at all. I didn't want anything to do with it until I was about 12. And she, she made that happen. Yeah. Um, and then she introduced me to, I guess, a friend of a husband of a friend of hers who was Colombian. And so we, I met him, I believe at, 11 or 12, he invited me over, made a Colombian breakfast, and then his family kind of took me under their wing. So I do feel very lucky because I know a lot of uh, international adoptees don't get that, but I had a few families, Latino families, that took me in. Um, one of my best friends was from Venezuela. I met her in the second grade and her family kind of took me in. So I did feel like I learned my culture. I felt comfortable with it. I liked the music. I liked the food. I knew kind of like the norms of, you know, things, how people do mm -hmm. things. So I did feel connected to it. And I, um, I appreciate that. That's pretty, that's pretty big from Michigan and yeah. just the mm -hmm. era, you know? Yeah. And it, and there really was like four families <laughs> and I kind of knew them all. So, but it, it helped on my first trip back to Columbia because I did go with a group of adoptees and everybody was very unsure and uncomfortable. And I felt like right I in there knew what to do. And so it was nice in that way. Um, so throughout my childhood, I, she did do that. Otherwise, I didn't really feel close to them. Never really felt understood. It was always very much kind of in my mind separated. And then I believe in my adolescence, um, it was pretty turbulent. I'd say I was definitely the re rebellious adoptee, as they say. Um, I was uh, just pretty much, I didn't care. And I believe now it had, it was a lot of adoptee stuff, but at the time I had no idea and couldn't put it together, like why I felt so not good enough or worthless or sad or depressed. I just didn't really understand it. Um, I did end up dropping out of high school. I did a lot of partying and drinking for a few years. A lot of stuff happened. I'm pretty much glad to be alive because the situations I put myself in were not good. And I really do feel I was very self-destructive mm -hmm. at that time. I just didn't care. And then I ended up kind of coming out of that a little bit. Um, found out I was pregnant with my son at 21. And I settled down immediately. And I always say I always knew I wanted to be a mom ever since I was a little, little kid. And so 
it's interesting to me how I didn't really care about myself, but I knew at that moment, like, nope, I'm going to be a good mom, like no questions asked, no problem. So that's when I kind of started looking more into adoption in general. Mm -hmm. I had kind of sort of been searching since I was about 16, 17, 18, but that was kind of just at the dawn of the internet. So there was not much you could really do anyways. And I didn't know how to contact people in Colombia at all. Um, but once, I think in about 2000, 2001, I found an online adoptee group for Colombians. And there was about, I think, 600 people in there. And that was the first time I had even known there was a lot of people adopted from Colombia. That's a lot of people in the group yeah. Yeah. at that time. Wow. And it was a Yahoo group. It wasn't, it was like the <laughs> Yahoo <Yeah>. book. <laughs> so, um, but just listening to their stories really just opened my eyes about how I'm not alone and the things I thought about are normal and you could search and people were talking about what they have done and things like that. So at that point, I wrote to my orphanage and called them and started requesting my documents, things like that. And they they gave them to me and it wasn't anything different than what my adoptive parents had had, which I think is also nice because I know a lot of adoptees struggle with their adoptive parents not wanting to provide them their documents. But yours were open in that way? <laughs> yep. My mom was, I wasn't really speaking to my adoptive dad at that time, but she gave me everything. She's like, oh, sure, you know, here, here's everything. Are they still together? Just No, oh. they divorced when I was 12, I believe. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I started doing that. Then I started kind of also learning about the corruption, about what happened to moms. And it never occurred to me any of that. It kind of occurred, oh, when I'm ready, I'll use this paper with this name and I'll find right. her. It was that, you know, that's just how it was going to happen. And now turning on 30 years of searching, I could have never thought it was going to take this long. Just what you said about, you know, babies being stolen from mothers too. I'm like, yeah. oh, just. Yeah. Oh, that's happened. And the business. Happens. Yeah. It, it, hap it happens. Ha happens yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. I did end up catching my orphanage in a few lies just through helping other adoptees. So it really kind of opened my eyes to what they were capable of and that I couldn't really, you know, trust what they say. So over the years for searching, I have had, I think, three investigators, been on radio, TV, newspapers, done every DNA test that is available to do postings. I have a search group all in Spanish that has a few thousand people in it that I made for my search, but invited people to share. And now it's just posting after posting, people <laughs> looking for each other. Um, every kind of lead I've had has gone cold or nothing's come of it. What, what, what did they tell you about yeah. your birth mother? Like, what was your story? The only story is I was left in the hospital and she left. And not like nothing about her. No, no nothing. And they, no. they claim to not have her name. They have a name, but it's what they call a partial name. Cause in Colombia, it's very common to use two last names. Yeah. And so they call that a complete name and a partial name is just like mm -hmm. a first name and a last name. So all I have is a first name and a last name. And so when you're looking in like the vital records or the databases in Colombia, everybody is listed with two names. You need that both. Would, yeah. And so that would help you kind of narrow down. So say you had a Jennifer Smith and a Jennifer Smith Jones, mm. but then there's Jennifer Smith Abrams and Jennifer Smith Richard. You don't know which, you know, there's so many possibilities and it's just kind of impossible. Um, to narrow down. And so I did have a few people help me and kind of look up the, the people in around the right age that my mother would be with those, with those two names, there were other second names. Um, and we kind of, with one of my investigators thought it might be if like one or two of these people did DNA testings with four individual women. So I'm like not 23 and me, just an individual t test between two people and all their names matched and they all had lost a girl 
Oh. They all had had the same story, which I've heard many birth mothers have, which is they had the baby, they thought they were fine. Then a moment later, the nurse or doctor comes in, says your baby passed. You need oh, to leave. My God. Without providing them a death certificate or any kind of information. So I did individual DNA testings with four women with that story and they were all negative. So then speaking, that's to, heartbreaking too, for them, because yeah. there's hope that you're that oh. baby too. Yeah. And oh, it was, and I'm still like in touch with two of those women who kind of said, like, I don't want to stop speaking to you. I know you're not my child, but I really, <laughs> yeah. and I visited, I'd stay, I stayed with a few of them and it is heartbreaking and it does reawaken that yeah. trauma in them also because mm-hmm. it's like they lost them then they get hopeful then they lose them again <sighs> and I think a lot of adoptees don't think about how that affects you know our mothers or family members I see because now that I help people search I've done a lot of searches and I've spoken with so many birth families in Colombia, and a lot of them will ask me you know my child found me and it was so beautiful. And then they kind of stopped talking to me. Can you talk to them? Can you Uh, speak to them? Can you ask them why? Can you, and then it's like, I have to explain, you know, like there's different levels of need for adoptees. Some, but some want to see how you're doing and ask some questions and then they're okay with that. Some want to fully immerse in the family. Some want a little in between and for the some mom. haven't dealt with their own feelings to really right. know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And some are still angry and have, you know, stuff to work out. And the moms just kind of don't really understand that. And so yeah. I think that's where there's sort of a block between the two sides, especially in Colombia, where it's not like the U.S. where there's like therapy and groups and everybody's talking. It's very much a, like more privacy. Those are things we don't talk about. Those are hard issues. So that is hard for me to explain sometimes. And then I've had to tell some adoptees who've said, will you help me search? I just want to know my medical info. I'm just curious. And I'm like, well, take a little bit and think because your mom is going to be incredibly, most of the time, incredibly happy to find you. And then if you have no real plans to stick around, you know, is it really fair to her? Like, I know we all have the right to know and we all want to search, but there's a whole nother person on that side and maybe siblings and maybe, you know, more that are going to be affected by our search too. This is a whole story in and of itself, these young women of Columbia. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them, the moms were poor, young, of course. a lot yeah. of them couldn't read. And so I've also, you know, seen adoptees who say, well, she never searched for me. <laughs> they don't back in like, those days women there were like so suppressed like they didn't have any rights and if they were poor they didn't have any respect if they walked into a government office or police station they would have been just told to go away of course Mm -hmm. this is why it was easy to get their babies yeah and so it's very much a coming together of cultures learning norms learning differences learning how things were back at that time understanding so much it's so much more than just i want to find my parents or i want to find my child i gave up for adoption Mm -hmm. so yeah my story is just that only a partial name supposedly a fake address and that's all i've had so after i did these dna tests and kind of searched the databases and there was nothing really coming up um people started telling me well i kind of have wonder if the name is fake like you spent all this time looking for this name and what if that's not real either? And I said, okay, well, there's, then that leaves me less information. And then after learning about all this corruption and sometimes the doctors would tell the women you had a boy when they really had a girl or Mm -hmm. vice versa. So then I kept (laughs) narrowing down my search and narrowing down the information. And then I was like, well, all I really have is that I was like born in March of 1978. And so how do you search? How do you search with that, you know? And so then I kind of exhausted my my search options. I narrowed down my postings 
on Facebook and other places too, if you had a baby, boy or girl, <laughs> in like March 1978, I could be your kid, like, you know. So then I didn't do anything for a few years. I did all those, like 23andMe and all those tests, probably in about 2007, 2008. Never got anything closer than a third or fourth cousin. Everything else was distant. Nobody knew anything when I wrote to them. And then about, I think a year and a half ago now, I found a second cousin and I was like in shock. So contact him. He's actually living in California. So I was like, wow, that's different. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Um, but I was so incredibly lucky because he was like the genealogist of the family and like <laughs> understood DNA and got all of the stuff because it goes way over my head so fast when I look at all that DNA stuff. So he figured out that me and him shared a great, for me, a great, great, great grandmother, for him, a great, great, because we are the exact same age, um, but he's a generation above me because his father was very old when he had oh, him. Yeah. So um, we figured out that this great grandmother had four children who've all passed away these four children all had children. So we needed to get a child from each one of these grandparents' lines. So we, obviously me and him were connected, but we were second cousins. So that means it probably wasn't his line because he would have been like a first cousin or somebody closer. Mm -hmm. So then we were like, okay, so now we need to find descendants of these three other children of this great, great, great grandmother. So we ended up finding I think one by accident sort of on Facebook because I or on one of the DNA sites because she came up as a match and I just emailed her and she said oh yeah my my mom is from Colombia blah, blah 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 so we figured it out but me and him were me and her were more distant so we were like okay it's probably not that line and then recently he helped me find one of the other lines and then my cousin said, well, let me contact him first because I don't want you to scare him away because people tend to be a little bit kind of standoff, not standoff, it's just untrusting in Colombia. So if you just write them and say, hey, I think I'm related to you, they tend to be like, whoa, like, I don't know, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of broke the ice with that guy with me. And then I started writing him and he was very nice and said like, sure I'll I'll test with you you know I'd love to meet you and then I was that's when we spoke and I that's was, what I was going to ask is that yeah. when we were going to see him yeah. yeah so I went down to Colombia in September October and he I was expecting him to want to meet at like a coffee shop or something because a lot of times you know how adoptees are kind of like the secret yeah and so they're like well, I'll meet with you but not at my house and I don't want to tell anybody but he said, no, come to my house. And then I thought it was going to be just him. And we walk in and his wife is there and two of his daughters are there. And I was just like, and that's when I got nervous. Cause I was like, I can talk to him alone. But the minute I knew his wife was there and I was thinking this could be my dad. I'm like, so now I'm like, you know, I'm a, I mean a whole different thing to her, you know? Yeah. So then I got nervous and I <laughs> just sat down and was like totally nervous. But he was super nice. I think we spent probably close to six and a half hours at his house. He sat down and told me all of his history, told me he asked other cousins. We had a meal there. Um, and he then really I cared to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he didn't have to do any of that. And that's not the typical response that most adoptees get. So I was pleasantly like shocked. <laughs> um, and then I did bring a DNA test for him to do. And then he kind of backed off a little bit and said, uh, well, I don't think I should take it. I think my nephew should take it because I think he could possibly be your dad. Because he had two brothers that were in Bogota, which is the city I was born in, in 1978 in college. And so he said I was across the country in a whole different city at a different university, but they were there. And so he said, there's a possibility. So they were his brothers or his nephew? His brothers, but the brother died. So I oh, have to okay. Son. Got it, got it. 
So I didn't really want to push him at that moment because he had already been, you know, way more helpful and welcoming than he really could have been. So I said, sure. And even if his nephew tested, if he was my dad, it would have come up as a very close match. Yeah. So I just said, sure, just test. I just need somebody to test. So we got the test all figured out. I sent it in and I got results, I think, on December 31st. And he was a second cousin. So that was very disappointing. I spent like a day pretty down about it um, because so I the, did... the nephew was the second cousin. Yeah. So that means. Yeah. His dad was not my dad. The guy right. I met was not my dad, nor his brother would be my dad. No. So it was just an, another letdown and it was hard. I spent a day kind of crying about it mm. and just upset because it's like that roller coaster, like searching yeah. is very emotionally draining. You get your hopes up. You tell yourself not to, you try to be logical about it, but you really, at the same time, really hope it's going to be that person. And then it's not. And then if you don't have any information, it's kind of like, well, you're back to nothing again. And that's what it really felt like back to nothing, back to nothing. So, I mean, it's, I don't know what to say about it. It's good in the fact that he is a second cousin. So now I have like two second cousins in the same family. So I Which know can, can help you narrow it down more as yeah. you go on. Yeah. Yeah. So but you're just kind of in a process of elimination that, right yeah. now. Yeah. And unfortunately for adoptees who are international adoptees, it's a very long, expensive process. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was yeah. going to say because each test, you know, could be 50 to a hundred dollars. Then you got shipping. Then you have to see, can they read the instructions? Are they going to understand how to do it? You have to pay for it to get shipped back. Or you go there and buy an airline ticket and do it yourself. But either way, it's not easy. And each step is emotional and like wearing. So are, are you close to the, um, the, the nephew and the second cousin both of them have you stayed in touch do they write to you yeah i do more i'm more in contact with the the, the guy i met when i went to his house mm -hmm. i think the nephew was a little kind of taken back because we figured out we were born the same year so if he were my brother oh. that would have been an infidelity you know so there is like all of that on top he, of it too. he was probably relieved and yeah, you're, yeah. you were not relieved yeah yeah um but I received a message maybe two weeks ago from the guy I met with. And he said, I'm really sorry. You, you know, it wasn't what you wanted. He's like, if it will help you, I'll test with you. And oh. so I said, yes, because I still want him to test with me because he is a generation closer. Right. So I really want to see what he's going to be. And then we did contact the a final person from that last line of children that this great mother mm -hmm. had, and she's agreed to test with me too. Good. Okay. So, um, I can't I'm believe how far you got, honestly. It's <laughs> yeah, it's kind of strange. It's like you're back at zero, but you still made progress, but you still don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I am planning another trip for March and I'm going to bring the two tests with me. And I decided that this trip, I don't necessarily want to focus on searching because it's taken a lot of out of me recently. So I really just want to go and enjoy the place and be there and experience it. So I'm just going to mail them the tests when I'm there, have them take it and mail them back to me. And then I'll bring them back with me and send them into my heritage when I get home. Do you have, when you go down there now that you're so involved with helping others, do you have a community there of people you see and enjoy? And um, because this is growing in a lot of ways for you. I mean, you have, you go to your home country yeah. and see, if, you know, I was curious about when well, you go my, there. I do have my partner of eight years as an investigator. He actually ah. worked with Catalina. She probably <laughs> oh, mentioned right. in her interview. So I do um, stay with him. That's how I remember. And she found yeah. you that way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we found out we were cousins. Yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting. Yeah. 
but so I have had this time about four birth mothers write me and say, I really want to meet you when you come down. So how long, when you go down, how long are you there? Um, this time I'm going to stay a month. Oh, I've good. A month, a few times. I stayed two months, one time. Um, but typically maybe anywhere from two and a half weeks to a month is my normal. So really enjoy it and see people and do yeah. things. And, yeah. Has your son gone with you? No, um, I had gotten divorced when they were in about junior high and my ex was being ridiculous and made a clause that I couldn't bring them to Columbia. Out of fear. Now that they are 22 and 21, they're kind of doing their own thing. They're in school, they have jobs. So I just think it's not kind of like their priority right now to do it. Like they want to do it, but they're also broke. So I'd have to pay for their tickets. Right. Yeah. I would (laughs) love to go all together, but I think it's almost impossible to narrow down their schedules and my schedule. So it might just be one at a time when they're able, which is disappointing to me because I really do want to share it with them. And I just think it shows, I don't know, I guess it's a good thing. They don't have all the adoptee kind of wounds and, you know, issues, but the fact that it's not a priority to them, priority to them it's my priority and it's like my story and it's also their age too yeah. you know yeah. I was gonna say and when and when they go they'll be like oh my god this is big you know that's yeah. what happens with yeah. young people you, yeah. they see yeah. it when they see it in person they're like right. oh mom <laughs> mom this is a big thing you know yeah. yeah and I think too if I did find somebody officially they said they both want to go yeah them. That's good. So I'm at the point right now where I'm just going to keep going. Like I say, I'll never stop. And I'll bring the tests and we'll see what happens with that. I did see a new tool on Ancestry, though, where they're, I don't know if you guys have seen it, um, where they separate your matches into like parents. I heard about this, but I don't know what it is. I haven't seen that yet. Okay. I'm. It's like helpful, but not That's... helpful because they don't say mom and dad. They just say parent one, parent two. Yeah. So I'm like, but so I'm like, which one is mom and which one is dad? You know, but it does help you see like, oh, these the lines. people are all on this group and these people are all in this group. So according to talking to all these people, they're thinking it's my dad's line that these people that I'm finding, which is also strange because my whole life I've only thought about finding my mom. Yeah. She's been my focus. She's been like everything. And now I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a dad. Oh, wow. Okay. That'd be cool to find him. I was like that too. Like, oh, yeah. I'm I'm curious. Oh, so Carolina is your cousin. Do you think on which side? I don't know because she hasn't popped up in any of those. I, I think we're third or fourth cousins, it said. So possibly on the mother's side. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking it might be mom just because of the city that she's from and where all my matches have panned out to be Mm -hmm. because she was in Palmira, which is like near Cali in this district Mm -hmm. called Valle de Calca. And then my whole group, I have a whole group of matches from that area. And then a whole group of matches from a city called Pasto, which is where all this family is from. Oh. And there's, I didn't know, but in talking to all these people, there's a big like influx of people that move from the city that I think is my dad's side to the bigger, more metropolitan city that is where she's from and where all my other matches are from. So I didn't know that there was like, it's very common for people to go back and forth and kind of move mm-hmm. there. So I'm thinking that one of them is like my dad is from, probably from the city and then my mom is probably from that area where she's from. But then that still doesn't make sense because we were both, or I don't know, remember if she was. I was adopted from Bogota, which is across the country in a whole different city. So oh, it's kind of not, like, from, not from where she was adopted from. Yeah, right? not from either city that are popping up in my matches. And so then I talked to a few people who said, well, Bogota is like, New York City. People come from everywhere. People stay for a little bit. People move. You know, people are from everywhere there. There's 
So just because you were born there does not mean that's where your parents were from. I'm like, okay. So now we're opening the church <laughs> to the whole country. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it's kind of like a Pandora's box. The more you learn, the more. What? Like, the more, you, yeah. Gets, the I more guess. you realize there's more to do. And yeah. 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 Well, I'm really, I mean, I like your keep going spirit and understanding that, okay, I'm going to have my setbacks and my disappointments, but I'll keep going. And, yeah. you know, eventually, eventually you'll find something. I, yeah. I think and a lot of people ask me, you know, why non-adoptees and adoptees, non-adoptees typically say, well, why don't you just, you know, you've been searching so long. Just give it a rest. Yeah. (laughs) Give it a rest. You know what you have now. You, you know, all the normal. And then the adoptees say, well, like, why don't you stop? You haven't found it. I know it's hard, but, and for me, I just, something in me, I just can't. You need to know. I'll I'll get, I'm like, I'm giving up or like, I'm giving up on her or I'm sort of giving up on myself and I don't want to stop, you know, because a lot of people too say, well, what if she didn't want to have contact with you after all this? Or what if, what if lots of what ifs? And there's a me, lot of what ifs, but what yeah. if, what if she does? And right. yeah. And what if she doesn't? So what now, you know, you, at I least, mean, you know, exactly. it's, this isn't yeah. necessarily about the outcome no. of the human interaction. It's about right. who am I? Where do I come from? What's my story? We all have a right to know that. Yeah. And to me, I think the worst, I think helping speaking to so many birth moms in the U.S. and in Colombia and really hearing their stories and empathizing with them as women, as people, as mothers, I understand the moms who can't have contact. Like, yes, it would hurt. Yes, I'd be disappointed, but I get it. You know, so that would be sad, but I could take it. For me, I think the worst outcome is to be, I was too late and that she had passed away. Yeah. Because then there's like no closure. There's no resolution. I can't ask her those questions. I can't give her a hug. I can't do anything. So I think that to me is the hardest. And then never knowing, like my, another fear I have is just kind of like being an old woman myself or on my deathbed and just never knowing. So to me, that's why I continue. Cause I don't want to never know. I don't want yeah. to be in position because that's what would be harder for me. And I think when people are searching, it's important to ask yourself those questions. What can I handle? What can't I handle? If this were to happen, how would it be? And it's like really preparing yourself and, you know, journaling or doing therapy and working through all these scenarios to yeah. see what you can and can't handle because you never know what it's going to be. It's very important what you're saying. I hope you will hear that, like kind of going into it, thinking of the questions, Yeah. you know, unlike the bull in the China shop, like I, I did it all wrong, you know, so. <laughs> Speaking Just, of, so w- with what you're saying, um, you do help people. Do yeah. you, do, where can people find you if mm-hmm. they're needing some help? Um, I have um, an email address that I can provide to you guys if you want to put it in the links after the yeah, show. Yeah, we will do that for um, But sure. basically anybody who writes me, I can help um, with, if you're a Colombian adoptee, I can definitely help you with the actual search, with finding an investigator. I can help you read your documents. I can help you see what information you have. Because a lot of times people say, I don't have anything. But we don't, most don't read Spanish. Most don't know what information is searchable, what information isn't. So a lot of times I'll just go over people's documents for them and be like, actually, you do have this and this Some and that, things. you know? Um, so I can help with that. And then I also do um, coaching on preparing. So all the things I was just talking about, really looking into all these possible outcomes. What are your feelings about it? What are your biggest fears? What are you most hoping for? You know, and a lot of people even simple as, oh, I want to find my mom. It never dawns on people. Well, you may find your mom, but you may find your dad. You may find eight cousins. You may find 10 nephews. You may find your grandparents and they may all want a relationship for you. And all these people will be writing you from day one. And some (laughs) people don't want that. Some people are like, that's too much. I can't handle that. I'm not used to that. I just want to talk to her. 
So then that's kind of like, well, how are you going to do that? Is that possible? So there's so much that comes into searching. And then. I mean, it's culture. very cultural too. You have to yeah. teach the cultural part of that, the right. family difference. Yeah. And then yeah. even so much as like, you know, adoptees say, I found my mom, I'm going to go down there. I want to stay in a hotel, but my mom wants me to stay with her. And it's like, that's what you do. That's cultural. Staying in a hotel would almost be like an offensive thing to do. Mm-hmm. But to us, we want our space. We want to be able to- <laughs> Especially adoptees, like I got to have some space. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, how are you going to deal with that? So those are things that I kind of work with. And then, so like preparing during search and like after search support basically is what I can offer. Well, and we'll I really definitely put that information for people listening to reach out yeah. to you. Um, another, thing, another thing I'm really kind of starting to focus on now too um, is I've seen lately on social media, like a big movement towards like, adoptees, you know, helping adoptees and not excluding adoptive parents, but I work with kids in my job and a lot of them are adoptees. And I very often have to come in contact with whether I want to or not (laughs) adoptive parents. And I'd say the majority of them are very, you know, defensive and they don't necessarily want to hear what I have to say, but, you know, few and far between want to hear it want and I'm not I don't sugarcoat things I'm very honest and there are some that want to know so I'm also available to talk to those adoptive parents who truly you know can take it can listen want to learn and I don't see that so much as you know promoting adoption or helping adoptive parents I see that as helping the adoptee because if I can help a parent parent a child better that's going to yeah. inter- help the child. Right, because adoption is not going anywhere, on, right. you know, unfortunately. Yeah. It's here to stay, but. Yeah. And, and so the adoptees are already with those parents. So exactly. the more help, the yeah. better for the exactly. child. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's kind of like the next realm. I do it in my job, but I'm also kind of looking into doing some mentoring for parents who are, you know, willing. And it's just such a need I see. Um at work, these kids who are, you know, eight, nine, 10 through teens, and I'll speak to them and they have nobody to talk to. They've never heard any of this before. And I think back at how self-destructive I was at that age. And I'm like, if I had had somebody come and tell me like all this kind of common adopting Mm -hmm. knowledge stuff that Mm -hmm. we have now, it would have changed so much. Mm -hmm. Same, same. And so I really feel this is important. Yeah. I feel like you're going to go a whole nother, you know, part two of your life is going to become this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I said, I have always wanted to be a mom. I've always felt a strong connection to kids and I've worked with kids since I was 13 years old. Um, But seeing this need and just, you know, really just wanting to give those kids what I could have used that was mm-hmm. not around <laughs> at all. No, and same. It's still, and it's not still not around. I think I was like adult, adult adoptees were like, oh yeah, we see all these things coming up on TikTok and Facebook and there's books and podcasts. No, these kids don't know any about anything about that. They have to wait till they're in their 20s. No, right. They're, yeah. still, they're still kept from it. Still. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. Without, with all the information out there about relinquishment being trauma and yeah. adoption being trauma, they're still not, it's just not happening. It's, it's mind boggling. Yeah. And it is sad to see in some realms, you know, some adoptive parents, you know, do keep that information. And it's mm-hmm. almost like, I don't want them to know all of this because if they know all of this, then they're going to start asking questions and they're going to want to search. It's like, it's already in there. Mm-hmm. It's already in there. You're just in not- the choosing yeah. to see it. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to make it worse. You're going to make that, you're going to alienate your, that relationship is going to suffer. Yeah. So that's kind of, I think, you know, like, like you said, my next path is I love helping adoptees. Um, but the, there's a real need for like under 18 mm-hmm. help adoptee kids. Well, um, please uh, let us know what happens when you 
yeah. when you go to Columbia. <laughs> I really want to hear, uh, keeping fingers crossed for you, that there's something, something yeah, coming. I know, me too. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And also stay in touch with us because as we go forward, I think we're all going to be in the same realm towards mm -hmm. the help and the cause and yeah. the long-term conversations. Definitely. And, and, you know, we may go into different areas where it would be nice to stay in touch and see what you're, you're doing as well. Definitely. 100%. And I think too, like, I would encourage anybody who wants to search to search. Mm -hmm. I don't think it can hurt. You know what I mean? Even if you have an outcome that is not necessarily what you wanted, it's an answer. It's a resolution. You can work on it. You can heal from it. You can move forward. Whereas if to me, if there's always those questions and there was wonderings, like it's kind of, how do you resolve that? I don't know. Well, and then Good we advice. get the time gets away from us, right? Mm -hmm. We, we get older, yeah. as you say, and, and people die and yeah, I agree. Yeah, Great that's advice. Another Another thing I have to tell people, I had somebody contact me who was my age and they were kind of like, well, you know, I'll get around to it. And I had to say, you know, respectfully, you know, I'm not trying to rush you. It's all on your time, of course. You know, I'm not trying to put anything on you, but I'm about to turn 45. So time moves on. So, you know, if you want to act on it, because I have had to tell people their parents have passed. And that's not an easy conversation to have and it's horrible news to receive. So I wouldn't, you know, wish that on anybody, but you also got to do it when you're able to do it. Yeah. This is all great information and we will put all of your contact info. So listeners, if you want to reach out to Katie, we'll have that information for you. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know it's like you're in a vulnerable place and yeah. not sure what's next, but I'm just glad. I'm glad you came back and that we're, we're with you again. Yeah. yeah. One really step closer. I want to hear about your trip too. Exactly. Yeah. And have fun, some fun on that trip. Yes. I'm glad you're going to just <laughs> go and, and really just yeah. get to know the place. And, yeah. And also I like going cause it'll be my, second time to have my birthday there so that's kind of significant to yeah be there, be there for my birthday yeah even though i'll be turning 45 <laughs> that sounds wonderful 45 yeah, yeah. i'll take I'll it i'll take 45 <laughs> <Me too. laughs> thank you so much katie no, no problem thank you thank you me. katie bye bye